Right, um, I don't know where I've gone wrong in life, to be honest. <laughs> the best hardware conference in the world, and here I am stood in a Pikachu suit. <laughs> anyway, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the BitFi. BitFi. I don't even know how you say this kind of thing. I've not actually spoken in real life to anybody about this. It's all been online. Um, it's called You Wouldn't Steal My Cloins, uh, because of one of the major players in this, John McAfee, who... Is, is is made this a very very interesting process. I'm going to do some technical stuff. I'm going to do a lot of the social media outrage and all the other things that happened around this. Now, the word "fuck's" going to be used a lot. It's in the screenshots. I'm going to say it. I'll try and keep it at that level. But if you don't like it, you probably best leave now. Who am I? Um, that's my avatar. That's what a lot of people know me as. Unfortunately, I'm a fairly nondescript guy of average height. Um, I don't normally wear this. Um, but it's becoming quite widely known now. Um, I don't work for Ledger or Tracer, either of the two big hardware wallet manufacturers um, that have been accused of it. Um, and how did I get involved with this whole BitFi thing? Well, when we saw this device, we formed a group that was called Thikamagasco. Um and what that stands for is the Hacker Collective, mistakenly known as Cyber Gibbons and somehow sometimes called Oversoft. So what happened was the media saw this and they said, Andrew Tierney of company Cyber Gibbons. So they're using my name thinking that Cyber Gibbons was like a professional pen testing company. So we came up with this, this acronym and it's brilliant because journalists ask who we are and we use this and then like 10 minutes later they email back saying, what does that mean? Uh, and then they actually put this in their stories. It's great. It's brilliant. So I'm Cyber Gibbons. I'll be honest, most of the technical stuff here I didn't do. I'm presenting the work of others here. I've just been an idiot on Twitter. Um, we've got Ryan uh, Castellucci, who has worked a lot on brain wallets. He knows a lot about cryptocurrencies and cryptography. Um, and we have Spodoia. It's really awkward, isn't it, when you just realise you've never said someone's handle out loud. Uh, Salim, who is sometimes four years old, sometimes 20 years old, sometimes 15, he broke the ledger um, to a certain extent. He broke Trazor, so he's, uh, he's the Chuck Norris of hardware wallets. Um, he was 15 when he did that, and I think he'll be 15 for every more, forevermore. So Benjamin Button or Chuck Norris, I don't really know. Um, there's loads of other people involved, though. Um, I'm not naming them here because it will get confusing, but there's been about 20 people involved. So what is the BitFi? Um, the BitFi is this little device here. Um, and what alerted us to BitFi was that they claimed it was unhackable. They didn't say it was hard to hack. They didn't say it was the most secure wallet in the world. They didn't say it was more secure than Ledger. They didn't say it was more secure than Trezor. They said it was unhackable. Um, and to us, that means that the device will never be hacked. It can never be hacked. It hasn't been hacked. It's absolutely impossible to hack it. Um, and as a hardware pen tester, that's a red flag. You know, this, this, is, this is already not looking great. Um, so we ordered um, four of them, just normal devices from them. They're $120 a pop, so they're not particularly cheap. We ordered four of them to have a look at. I'm going to explain what a hardware wallet is and how cryptocurrencies work, though, just so you've got a background and you know the attacks that we're carrying out. Now, for nearly all cryptocurrencies, at a very simplistic level, you have a private key. And from that private key, you derive a public address. That public address is where people send your funds. You can see funds at that public address. To access those funds and do things with them, you need the private key. Now, the problem is, if you store that private key on your laptop, if someone steals your laptop, if malware ends up on your laptop, if someone performs a cold boot attack against your laptop, it's compromised, that key's gone. So what was developed were, first off, people started storing their keys on a USB stick. So that meant it wasn't always stored on the computer. So it was offline to a certain extent. The problem with this is, to actually use it, you've got to move that key back onto the computer. If you move the key back onto the computer, it can be compromised again. So the key can be leaked. So then what came along was a hardware wallet. So this is very generically a USB device or something connected directly to your computer. It stores your key and it can sign transactions you send to it. That key will never leave the hardware wallet. So the key never gets transferred. It's like a little black box that signs transactions. So what you can do is you can say send one Bitcoin to Cyber Gibbons. It will send it through and it will go through and sign it. The problem is, if someone compromises your laptop 
or steals the device, they can then start sending their own transactions through your hardware wallet. It's just it's a black box that's just signing things. So what they did was they added a pin code to the device. So you have to physically enter a pin code onto the device before it will sign transactions. That pin code, if you get it wrong, the delay gets longer and longer and longer, and you shouldn't be able to get the keys out of it. The other problem is that if your laptop's compromised, instead of saying send one Bitcoin cyber givens, what we could do is we could say send 100 Bitcoins to McAfee. Now, if the wallet doesn't tell you what the transactions it's signing is, your computer could say send one Bitcoin, it could send send 100 Bitcoin, the box would sign it, and you'd be compromised. So what they did was they added a display onto the hardware wallet. So there's actually a display on there that says send one BTC to Cyber Gibbons. So you confirm the transactions the same on the two devices. So that's, that's prevented or made that attack much more difficult. Sorry. Um, I only did these slides this morning. Now, the other problem is that generally when people create their own passwords, they create crap passwords. We've known this for years. Um, and the problem is, it's the same with the hardware wallet. If you can generate your own password, you're going to generate maybe something that's got 30 bits of entropy in it. You're going to stretch that out to a 256-bit key, and you can still brute force that. It's still brute force territory. Um, so what they did was they put a true random number generator or some form of random number generator inside the wallet. So the key's generated in the wallet. It has you know, as much entropy as it needs to have, so it can't be brute forced. And that key, after it's been generated, will never leave the wallet. So we've got a key generated from the random number generator to protect poor passwords. It's stored inside a secure black box. So we can't, if we steal a wallet, we can't just pull the keys out of it. It is possible sometimes with a lot of effort, but if we can delay it for long enough for some to, someone to react, that's fine. Signing needs the pin, so you can't just steal the device and start signing transactions. And the transaction's displayed on the device, so you can check the transaction's correct. Um, BitFi changes all of this. Now, instead of being USB connected, it connects via Wi-Fi. So it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it. You give it your Wi-Fi uh, password, and it will connect through. Um, but their kind of key thing is, is that it doesn't actually store your key. That's what their kind of selling point is. What they say is it doesn't store the key. So instead, every single time you use it, you've got to type the key into it. It will then calculate your Bitcoin addresses. It will sign transactions based on what you type into it. So that the human's got to type the key in. And the idea is, therefore, if the wallet doesn't store the key, if you steal the wallet, if you compromise the wallet, there's nothing on there to steal. So this was kind of the idea. Um, it's quite commonly called a brain wallet, this. Something stored in your head you translate that into a private key and use that. Now, these have got lots of problems because you're bringing back in the human. You're saying a human's doing this. It's not a good idea. Now, in all their marketing material, they said your private key keys are never stored anywhere except your own brain. Well, we can see that's not true. We type it into the device. You know, for, for any level, this is just broken thinking. You sit there, you type it in, it's shown on the screen, they've got to calculate the keys. Of course it's stored for at least a finite period. Um, it kind of started with this. Um, so this is their logo, um, as you saw earlier. Uh, well, it, it was their logo. Um, I asked a friend to modify it somewhat, um, and, uh, and they did this. This caused my Twitter account to kind of snowball a little bit, and a lot of people kind of became interested in the whole BitFi thing. Um, they set up a bounty. Now, what this bounty was, it's for $100,000. This is that's a big amount of money. Um, I quite like $100,000. But the rules are quite um, constraining, to say the least. They will take a BitFi wallet that they own. They will load coins into an account by typing a key, a salt, and a phrase into that device. Um, they will send that to you, and you have to get the keys off it to get the coins. Now, if their selling point, the fact that it doesn't store keys, was true, this would be impossible. But we already know that that's not true. We know it's got to store it for at least a finite period. But the other thing is, this doesn't really prove the device is unhackable. All that says is that the device is only, it isn't going to be vulnerable to device theft. If you steal it, you'll not be able to recover the keys. You can still backdoor it. You can still connect it to a malware-infected computer or a malware-infected network. 
But they said the bounty program is not intended to help Bitify identify security vulnerabilities since we already claim that our security is absolute. They were really doubling down on this. They were saying there was no hacks, nothing you could do to this device to compromise security. So they call it Bitfy's unhackable, but what we they think they mean is Bitfy's not vulnerable to one really specific attack in that bounty. Now it starts getting ridiculous. So they made a number of claims about this device. Do you all know who McAfee is? He uh, he invented cyber security. <laughs> um, he, we're fairly sure that um, Bitfy have entered into a contract with McAfee to promote the product. We don't know that for certain, but we're fairly sure. Oh, this is hot. <sighs> he said, there's no memory to hack, no data. All of your money is stored in a memorable phrase of your choice in your head. Um, now, there is nothing but the phrase in your head. We get the device. And this is a bit fine. There's one here. In fact, I'll pass this round because I, I don't really want to wave it around. Pass that round. Everyone can look at it. Um, it's broken. Um, that chip there, the one that says 4C, a lot of you will recognize it, is an EMMC flash chip. So it's clearly got data on it. It's a phone. Um, there was this very famous tweet as well. There is no RAM. Um, and obviously, you flip the board over. That chip there, it's a bit faint, says LPDDR3. Now, I can't actually find the data sheet for that chip because it's made by a, a kind of uh, small Chinese manufacturer. But I'd imagine LPDDR3 stands for low power dual data rate RAM. I don't know. It looks like RAM to me. <laughs> Next thing, the Bitfy wallet is only $120. Um, so it's about the same price as most other hardware wallets. As a computing device, it's much more costly to manufacture than ordinary hardware wallets. It's a phone. It's a cheap MediaTek phone missing most of the components. So it's got space for a camera. That little hole there would be where the camera fits. <laughs> it doesn't have a microphone. It doesn't have a microphone on it. It doesn't have GPS. It doesn't have a 3G baseband. So they have stripped some bits and bobs out of it, but not that much, to be honest. MediaTek aren't great for security. Um, a lot of their phones have vulnerabilities in them. Um, McAfee doubled down on this. It is absolutely not a cell phone or anything even resembling a cell phone. All cell phones are hackable. <sighs> there and there are labelled SIM 1 <laughs> and SIM 2. That's a phone. But it got better. You go to Bitfy's own website and look what they call the image of it. <laughs> that, that, there was one interview with them where they claimed that it was a teeny tiny tablet, not a small phone. I'm just, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, if you import a device into the US that transmits radio frequency, it's got to be FCC certified. So it's got to undergo compliance testing. Now, we got the device that I passed around. I didn't pass around the back plate, no FCC label anywhere. It wasn't FCC certified. Now, we mentioned this a couple of times on Twitter, maybe. And uh, they did get it certified by the FCC about a month and a half after they started selling it. And here's the manual that you have to submit. It says, on shutdown state, long press the power key and the system went to the process, blah, blah, blah. And there, where does it say? The phone will return back to the previous interface. So the manual for the device calls it a phone. It's a phone. Right. Now people are asking, can't someone just look over your shoulder and see what phrase you are typing? No, 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 no. The Bit5 wallet has a screen with an extremely narrow viewing angle and they won't be able to see anything. Try it. Now, I'm kind of one of those people who tries these things. Um, <laughs> so there's my Bit5. Now, I know that's not 180 degrees viewing angle, but I can read that salty Bitfy tears and the quick yellow gibbons jumped over the lazy Bitfy. You can read everything you need to generate the keys off the screen. Now, I thought this would be enough to kind of disprove that claim, but, but no. Uh, someone who really likes Bitfy posted this picture of their screen um, saying, look, it's a narrow viewing angle. And I will, I will grant them that the only angle you'd ever use it from has a low viewing angle compared to the other ones. So this is what you see if you tip it when you're using it. Now, you still can see up there. You can see remnants of the text. Now, I just kind of dismissed this. I thought there was no way I'd get this. Then one of my followers, who I can't remember who it is, and I couldn't find his enhanced image, enhanced that image. 
So he took that image, he did some contrast changes, a few edge detects, things like that. And uh, via reverse engineering the key derivation, which Ryan had done on the, a binary a, a while back, put it through his thing, and we found that his phrase was, why is Dan so crazy about Monero? And the, the salt was set to test70 at bitfi.com. That gave us his public address, which we could confirm had a balance on it. And then one of our team went and took his money and moved it from his first Bitcoin address to his second Bitcoin address, topping the fees up as well. So we proved that we had access to his funds by him posting an image that was to prove that we couldn't get access to his funds. <sighs> so that, that was funny. Um, this, this is great. So there's a lot of shills, a lot of people. Now, a few people have messaged me to say they have been paid to defend BitFi. I'm not going to show those DMs here because it, it exposes individual people. Um, but this person, this is a public tweet. Thanks to image editing software or techniques such as the techniques required to read Poison's passphrase, it was possible to obtain his phrase. Without changing brightness contrast, his funds would have been safe. It's, it's a hardware wallet where as long as no one enhances an image of you entering your passphrase, you won't get the funds. So the device itself. Now, we ordered lots of these devices. We've been given some more. I've got two sealed ones here. I don't want to open them because they've stopped shipping them. We want to do some demos to journalists. This is how they come in a, in a lovely little box. And um, you can see it's got a piece of tape sealing it. So it's a, a piece of normal clear tape. Underneath the clear tape is a sticker, a round sticker, that I presume is the tape that was originally on there. It's been cut to open the box. So they're already shipping all of their devices. So it looks like the outer packaging has been tampered with. Now, if you speak to any of the hardware manufacturers, one of the biggest things they struggle with is supply chain tampering. That's the thing they're really stressed about and the thing they probably haven't solved that well, in my opinion. Gets better, though. The box has a label on it that says it's a Nox MD40, the code name for it, BitFi, and it has a serial number. Now, the serial numbers seem to start from zero and go up. The highest one we've seen is just shy of 3,000. So we can kind of infer maybe 3,000 have been sold. Um, but what we found was the serial number inside the device doesn't match the serial number on the box. So a device you've got to be confident in the supply chain of, they haven't even matched the box to the back of it. So we don't know how this has happened. We suspect they've had to open them up to flash them or something and not put them back properly. Moving on to the hacks. Now, I'm not going to actually do uh, demos. I'm going to show you the videos because Salim did the attacks and he's much better at me uh, doing these things. The first one we found is that this is from the data sheet for the MediaTek chip. The touch screen has an LCD and it also has a capacitive touch panel, CTP, capacitive touch panel. Nearly all phones, the way that those touches get fed back to the OS are via I2C, a serial protocol. There's one touchscreen controller that encrypts that connection. What are the odds of them using an encrypted touchscreen? Negligible. Indeed, we looked into it, put a logic analyzer on the ITC, and you can see the person's finger moving about on the screen. Now, the bit five passed around, there's plenty enough space for us to put a small microcontroller that connects the ITC bus that registers where you touch your finger on the screen. We didn't actually go and do it because we thought there'd be better attacks to look at this device. So there's the, you can see SCL, SDA, ground. This is the, the ribbon cable going through to there. It's already broken, in my opinion. If you can do an attack this simple with that much space, the device is broken. But it got better than that. MediaTek devices have a bootloader. That bootloader can be locked, but it's very, very rarely locked. You use a tool called SP Flash Tool to read it out. You plug it in via USB, restart the phone, and you can read the firmware. We did that and we got a dump of the firmware. So these are all the different partitions here. Now we did find one protection here, user data, where all the applications are stored in Android, was encrypted. So, and the way those keys are stored is actually quite secure. You have to root the phone to be able to get access to user data. You can't access user data directly, but they didn't implement secure boot. What that meant was, it was pretty simple for us. Now I'm not disclosing the method we use here. Now this may or may not be agree with everyone's ethics, we don't want to give Bitfire free pen test, so we're not telling them how we did this. However, if you've ever rooted a phone yourself, that word there, RAM disk, is enough for you to go and replicate this. It's not hard at all. With root access to that, 
what I did was I dumped the memory from my device after I'd used it. Now, stupidly, I chose a really, really um, short pin. If you've ever used a BitFi, has, has anyone actually used one here? Because I think a few people have bought, no? Not that many of them exist. The keyboard is tiny, the keyboard is awful. You've got to enter an eight character salt and a 30 character phrase. If you do that 100 times whilst you're testing vulnerabilities, if it's a proper word, it gets very annoying. So I set it to 11112222 and so on. This is a memory dump from the phone taken a long time after I'd used it. And there you can see my phrase and underneath it, my salt. That's everything you need to clear out my wallet. Daniel Gallagher then took those things, generated the keys, cleared out my $7 of Bitcoin. So we've already proven the memory on this device holds onto the keys for longer than it needs to. But it's still a bit of a contrived attack. It was at this point that we won a Pony Award. Um, this is like a, a, it's the lamest vendor response. This is really early on in the game. We'd only really bounced a few tweets back and forth. McAfee hadn't really got involved. Um, and we still got this, well, they got it, but we've actually got the little thing. Um, and we, what we did on this momentous occasion was we had Salim um, run Doom on the Bitfi. Um, see if I can get the video playing. So there we go. Just to prove we've rooted it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, we we're a bit deceptive here. Um, the wires on the back of it had absolutely nothing to do with the attack. We just, they're not even attached. They weren't even glued or soldered or anything on. Um, we did it to keep Bitfi guessing. We didn't want them to realize that the USB port was the vector. We, didn't, we wanted them to think you had to open the case and do something like mystical to the device. <laughs> is mystical the right word? I don't know. But here the thing is, they said, is it safe to purchase BitFi hardware wallets from other retailers, or should I only purchase it directly from BitFi? And they say other hardware wallets are prone to a man-in-the-middle attack, because they can be tampered with. Um, and they said it's not the case, you can buy them from anywhere. Now, I think some hardware wallets are partially resistant to this, or harder to attack, but I think all of them recommend you only buy them direct. Um, they were so confident about this that they said that if it had been tampered with, this digital signature and words that... I mean, we've not done anything technical here. That it wouldn't handshake with the dashboard, which is the web interface. Even the slightest thing is modified, it won't sync and your attack won't work. Um, now, I knew this wasn't the case because I'd rooted the device and it was working absolutely fine. They set up a second bounty. This one was only $10,000. So we can already see they're not getting, they're losing confidence in what's going on here. Um, this one was a bit easier to claim. The firmware of the BitFi device is modified. We've definitely done that. After the firmware is modified, the device still needs to connect to the BitFi dashboard. Yep, we've still got that. The device should then be able to transmit either private keys or the user secret phrase to a third party. So I haven't quite done that. Um, so what I did, this is a BitFi wallet. It's turned on. It's running V89, which was the latest firmware at the time. It's running Telnet that I've put on there. So I can just connect to it. You can see it's running the two, um, the two apps to do with... Um, Bitfi, com.rowkits.noxadmin and app.rowkits.android. Rowkits are like a third company that's kind of entered the fray. I don't really want to talk about it too much. Um, Netstat, I can see that it's making a connection out to 4069.1157. That's Bitfi's server. You know, we've already got a connection going out to it. We can see it's established this connection. I loaded my own certificate authority onto the device. It's actually running Android 8.1 which is quite surprising. I mean, that's quite up to date. Um, I should really have opened that, but um, it's running Android 8.1. Um, it's a bit awkward to put your own CA onto it, but not if you're root. With that, I can intercept all of the communications. Now, you can see down the bottom here, and I, didn't, I don't have any of my actual images, so these are all tweets and screenshots. Nox sig and Nox message. So there's this thing that could be a signature, could be a message, things like that. Um, so it does have some kind of signature going backwards and forwards. But it, it doesn't matter. I can tamper with any of the data there, and it just gets fed through to the BitFi. So there we go. Sign and pay. It's getting a transaction. Send 10,000 Bitcoin to celebrate 10 million, 10 billion th transactions. We've got arbitrary control of the message on the device. We can write what we want on it. It doesn't validate it. It doesn't do anything. So we have had to root it. But I think we've proven that this is broken. Now, the thing was, I haven't actually got the phrase off it yet. I haven't done that in a, apart from dumping the memory. So we've got the I2C bus, 
Um, but another way of doing it is when you touch the screen on an Android phone, it raises events. So you've got a, a tool called Get Event. Dev input event two on these devices, it varies from Android device to Android device, gives you these. Now 35 is the X, Y, uh, is the X, and 36 is the Y. So those are the coordinates where you're touching the screen. So I wrote a simple parser that would read, get event, send it to a third party server, and then we'd have the pass phrase. So uh, let's get that video going. So you can see me entering, well, the, the viewing angle's not great. <laughs> 1111, one, 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 and then I enter the rest of the phrase down the bottom there. It's another thing you'll notice. If anyone was watching you do this, they can see it on the screen. There's no keyboard randomization. It's not masked on the screen. Even once the transaction message shows up, it stays there. I'm running Netcat to receive the data on another machine. I run my little script, and it recovers the key. Now, you'll actually notice there that there's an error. It says 33222 rather than 22222. Um, I've got the coordinates of the screen slightly wrong. But you know, it is what it is. We've managed to get the seed and phrase. Um, so there we've got a transaction. That's the signed transaction being sent to um, sent uh, out to the blockchain. There it is on the blockchain and you can see again relayed by. You know, that's the IP address that we saw at the BitFi server. We've managed to inject our transaction on a modified device. Um, now Salim might be 16 but he's, he's like one of those people who actually like is capable of finishing things, which I'm not. <laughs> and uh, he decided to develop a much better attack. Um, so what he did was he used Frida. Um, so you can see there he's putting in an address to pay, the amount to pay, sends a request. It shows up on the device. And now what he does is he types in random characters. So he's not typing in his passphrase. What he's doing is proving that we're actually grabbing it off the air. It will then show up on the screen here. So you can see his random phrase there. This has all been done via Frida on the phone, which just hooks into the Java on it. So now he enters his genuine, uh, his genuine salt and phrase. And there we go. It's sent. And then he actually demonstrates here that you can see it on the blockchain immediately. Now, we've definitely met Bounty 2 at this point. We've tampered with the device. It's not doing anything. Now, when we told them about this, what they did was they said, this bounty program has been discontinued. That's not how bounty programs work. You don't wait until someone shows you the vulnerability, then tell you that you're not going to pay the bounty out. Fuckers. <laughs> now, I had a bit of a protracted discussion, would maybe not be the right word, with them on uh, via DM, and uh, they did admit that the keys do stay in RAM for a brief period of time. Someone does a memory extraction very quickly, they'll be able to get the keys. And it's not a real world attack. Um, have you heard of a cold boot attack? Now, this device is vulnerable to a cold boot attack. It's got DDR RAM, which stores your keys. It's got a system on chip, which connects via USB. If you don't explicitly zero or randomize that key, it will stick about in memory. Now, if the device stays on, it will stick about for weeks. We've had one device hold onto the keys for two weeks. Okay, so that's a very long time. Now, in an interview, they said that we think if the guy was able to retrieve the private key from the device or something like that, it had been done on a rooted device. But if you root a device, you have to restart it. And when you restart it, it wipes the RAM clean. Why, why did they assume this? When you restart it, it wipes the RAM clean. Now, Ryan posted this before we started all this, and he said, much of hacking is about understanding systems better than those who built them. It's so true. We didn't assume that the RAM would be wiped clean. So what we did was we developed a cold boot attack. Cold boots may be a bit of a misnomer. You don't have to chill the device. It works at room temperature. Um, so it's, it's more like a data remnants attack, but we call it cold boot. Um, and all we do is we restart the phone. I mean the, the bit fine, not a phone. Not a phone. <laughs> we restart the device and we root it. Now, Slim had to do some special work. SP flash tool doesn't always grab the device. Um, it takes too long to power up the DDR control and a few things like this, but what it does is it he built a new tool that just does it more reliably and more quickly, so the RAM stays powered down for as little possible time. Might be 50 milliseconds, I don't know, but the thing is, the data's all there. So I'll show you this video. This one's got music. I don't know if it's going to come through. Oh, I've no music.
I'm only I'm only using HDMI, so it doesn't matter. It, it was Benny Hill music. You can see him. Now I want to know: Can Slim type this quickly, or did he speed it up? I don't know. So processing request. Please wait. So it's signed a transaction. All right. Like a magician, no wires attached. He plugs the USB in. Now he's done this on another phone. So it's just an Android phone. So it says waiting for unhackable device. <laughs> um, it's putting something called the the DA, the dump agent, onto the device. So it loads like a secondary bit of code onto the device. It then displays the, the logo for BitCry. Now, I don't know if no one gassed ramen a penny from the wallet. It was something that McAfee said. So we, it says gassing ramen, which is, uh, it just seems to have ended up with this joke. So at the moment, what it's doing is it's dumping the memory. It's got a gigabyte of memory. It's dumping it over USB. So it's not the fastest thing. But it's less than two minutes. So now that's it. You can unplug the BitFi. So if you were going through airport security and you'd used this device and not powered it off, someone could do this. If you left it unattended for a minute, someone could do this. So it sits there, and then eventually, it's also let, it removed all evidence. The bit file's gone back to normal. It's no longer rooted, so the person would have no idea. It's longer than I thought it was when you're up on stage. They're nice dots, those, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> it does get there eventually. Again, the key's not actually quite right on this because of a mistake in passing um, nulls in the memory, but it does work. It logs it to a file. This suit is way too hot. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> um, one of the interesting things we found, and I, this is an aside, I'll talk while this is doing this, they recommend using what's called a Diceware password. I don't know if anyone's heard of this before. So what Diceware does is instead of you choosing a passphrase, what you do is you roll a dice six times, I think, and then you choose from a list of 7,000 words. You roll the dice six times again, choose from a list of 7,000 words, and keep on going like that again and again. So you go, my very, very secure secret phase, and don't be too salty. It's recovered it. A cold boot attack against it. Now, th these are normal words. And what we found was even if the memory does degrade, ASCII dictionary words have got a lot of redundancy in them, especially if you choose them from the diceware list. So if you see ERY, it's almost certainly very. You, don't, you can lose a lot of data. So even if the cold boot attack was slightly uh, degraded, the data in memory, it would still work. Now that it gets to the awful bits, the response from BitFi. So we had the no one gas ram and a penny from the wallet. They were so focused on their bounty wallets. You had to do the attack on a wallet they sent to you. It couldn't be against your own wallet. It had to be their wallets. They did eventually send us three wallets, even though we didn't ask for them, three bounty wallets. Um, they powered them down. That didn't stop us getting the SSID and PSK of the CEO of the company from it because he connected them to his Wi-Fi. So we managed to geolocate that using Wiggle and found, find where he lived, which is not great. <laughs> There's been a lot of memes. They're kind of like quite hard to, to bring out in, in, independently. Now, this is when it started getting a bit dark. This is my last tweet as my shift is ending. Remember, the lies and deception you deliberately spread about BitFi can have consequences. I mean, this is quite threatening. It was deleted maybe half an hour later, uh, not before Matthew Green and Ken White and a load of crypto people had retweeted it. And when I say crypto, I mean cryptography. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was aimed at uh, Sleem, not me. Um, and then when I asked them about this on DM, they said that this tweet was concerning this. They were really offended by a logo of theirs with diarrhea pouring out of it, which is maybe correct. But look at the words there. It's aimed at Celine, not me, with that as my avatar. It doesn't mention the logo. It says lies and deception. So they're trying to get out of it. They're trying to be deceptive. You know, it's not concerning that. An interview with their um, their... Vice President of Operations, Bill Powell. He doesn't seem to have any history, may not even exist. We think it's rather disappointing. A lot of media picked up on claims made by some person hiding behind a picture of a cat. <laughs> no, we're not actually sure who they're talking about here. <laughs> it could be Daniel Gallagher. But I think they might have been talking about me, actually, and, uh, and the Pokemon one, because uh, later on, 
You look at the guy who's been posting all this, Cybergames, the guy posts something every two seconds, 24 hours a day, like he doesn't sleep or something. If somebody had a real job in cybersecurity, they wouldn't have so much time to spend on Twitter. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Seriously, I mean... I was on holiday. <laughs> What I was actually doing on holiday was I was digging holes because I'd learned from the best people in the business how to dig really, really big holes and not get out of them. <laughs> um, then came the shills. Um, there was Daniel Power, BTC. Now, he started referring to me as the yellow cat that took too much acid. Um, again, I, I found, you know, the vulnerabilities exist. It doesn't matter how off my nut I am on acid. The vulnerabilities are still there. Not that I was, UK government. <laughs> and, uh, but what it turned out was this Daniel Power guy was in fact the CEO of BitFi, or we very strongly suspect he was the CEO of BitFi. How did we work that out? Well, if you go and try and reset someone's password on Twitter, it will show you the first two letters and you know the characters in their domain. So that's D-A something 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 at B-I-T-F-I dot com. <laughs> I mean, it's not conclusive, but when we called him on it, the account got deleted. Um, you can see the number there ends in 58. The account then changed to a ProtonMail account, and then later on, another account using very similar language came along called Love Crypto. Um, and again, look, 58, and then a ProtonMail account. Again, it's very suspicious. We really think they're buying and paying for accounts. Then McAfee, McAfee writes in. Am I a wannabe? I fucking invented cybersecurity. Really? Just. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much where he didn't invent cybersecurity. Then, the most in depth review of the BitFi wallet to date the crypto profit, honestly, crypto. So you had to go and download a PDF of their magazine, and you got this thing, and it said, all in all, the device is possibly the, possible, the most secure I've come across, boasting many security measures. Blah, you know, that sounds, that's a good review, isn't it? Um, we challenged them on this, saying, you know, you should maybe take into account our security findings. Turns out that the person who wrote that has never touched a BitFi. They've never used a BitFi. They had just read the page and said it was the most secure thing in the world. So, one of the big problems with the bounty is if you're so confident the device is unhackable, why put $10 or $50 of cryptocurrency onto it. Put the full bounty onto the device. Put the full £250,000 onto that device. You can put the same 250000 across all the bounty devices so you don't need lots and lots of cash. So I challenge McAfee, McAfee, however you say it, to come to London and do it. We're going to do it in front of a film crew. We're going to have an independent person there to look at it. Um, and then he tweeted this. Take what you, w take what you get, asshole. Um, he was only offering the $25. Um, he quickly deleted this and then sent me this DM. And he upped the game to $20 million. That's quite a lot of money. I mean, like, I'd like 100000 I'd really like $20 million. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's a fairly simple motivation. But I will pay your way to the States, put you up at my house for as long as you need. <sighs> he knows that I won't accept. You're just trying to get publicity by fraudulently claiming you can hack it. If so, motherfucker, then do it. What, seriously? So then he tweets this out. He didn't even at me. Um, now, he said that I refused this. And um, the thing was that about five other people took him up on the offer. Um, I wouldn't want to go to his house. Why wouldn't I want to go to his house? Because immediately after he tweeted that challenge, he tweets this. Serious dudes on a serious mission. Just received an order of one off M4s. Like, yeah, that's a bit troubling, um, to say the least. Then, he hasn't been sober for 41 years. <laughs> no. <clears throat> it gets better, though. John McAfee went on a naked shooting spree in September when he thought he heard intruders. He was in the middle of having sex with his wife when dogs started barking. He jumped out of his bed naked and started shooting at the walls and ceiling. 
No, I am not going to your house. <laughs> so then it kind of gets a bit threatening. He's saying, my career's finished. You will be the laughing stock of the world. You lost, dude. Go hide under a rock. Oh, there's no excuse you can ever come up with. Yes, yes, I don't want to get shot in the face. That's why I don't want to do it. <clears throat> Got a bit weird then. Um, he's openly said he won't accept the challenge from anybody else. It's just about me going there. He doesn't have the guts to actually say that this wallet's unhackable. To put all 20 million on it, any location in the world, and say, can you get the coins off it? Probably because he knows we'll get that. He posted this, um, this link to me, which is, I don't know if you've seen Clone Zone. It allows you to like load the New York Times or artnews.com and then modify it. And um, this is what he came or someone came up with. It got sent to me. Andrew Tierney, aka Cyber Given, Cyber Security Professional or Cyber Pervert Enthusiast. Um, yeah, it would be fair to say that the article wasn't massively pleasant. I archived it and tweeted it out though. Um, it did have this beautiful phrase in it though, which was smash my jigglypuff. I never thought I'd put that in front of such a large group of people. <clears throat> so, where do we go from here? I mean, it, it, it's completely hacked. There's, there's nothing left to the device. The thing is, with hardware wallets as it stands, you are almost entirely trusting the person who made that hardware wallet to not backdoor or do something malicious to you. Whether it's a ledger, whether it's a trazor, whatever. You've got to rely on the fact that they do not deploy a malicious firmware to that device. Now, based on what you've seen here, would you trust BitFi to operate a secure, safe service for your device? All it would take is for them to push a malicious firmware to your device, and that could be it. Your keys could be stolen, it could sign transactions that you don't want. Now, we think that the concept's broken. The whole idea of entering your key every time is broken. Now imagine going to the shop to buy a can of Coke, and instead of getting your contactless card out and putting it on the reader, you have to sit there with your BitFi and type in your sort and phrase with everybody looking over your shoulder. It's not really going to work. That's even if it's implemented well, and they've not implemented this well. One memory dump we had had so many copies of the keys in it and so many copies of the phrase and sort that it was just unbelievable. You know, it was scattered everywhere. It's a single use device. All it does is act as a wallet. There's no other applications to fill the memory with other stuff like there would be on a normal phone. We don't think they can fix it. I can't conceive of a way that you can take a device that doesn't implement secure boot and implement secure boot remotely. Because fundamentally, you've got to burn into that some form of key, some root of trust. And doing that remotely is a massively high risk operation. I don't think we're going to get the bounty, whether that's the 10K, the 250K, or the 20 million. I don't think that money is ever going to turn up. Um, now the interesting thing is, I think they've got the bounties the wrong way around. I think the big challenge for hardware wallets is the evil maid attack, so someone tampering with your wallet and altering the firmware, or a supply chain attack, tampering with it before you get hold of it. I think they're far more risky, because there's no, if you backdoor that wallet and someone uses it, you will get their keys. The cold boot attack, though, is much higher risk. They might not use the keys. They might not have entered the keys. The device might be powered down to much lower risk attack but it's also possible to really fix the cold boot attack. They could scrub the memory fairly effectively, so it only persisted for seconds, milliseconds. There's still exposure to risk, but it's much lower. Um, yeah, that's where the story ends. Um, it's been a crazy month. Um, I don't know what Thikamaska Gal is going to do after this. Um, there's plenty more stuff in the crypto space that's equally as bad. No, 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 there's not. It's really funny, the talk I did earlier about uh, Z-Shave, I thought the disclosure process for that was a bit painful. Um, disclosing vulnerabilities in the past, you know, I've, I've been told I'd be eating through a tube for weeks and stuff like this before, but I just, I've never seen such a crazy level of attention or such a reluctance to kind of back down on claims. It's clearly not unhackable. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's the story of Bitfight, and I really, really need to take the suit off. <laughs> and I'm wearing trousers. He's not stripping. Um, okay, so who wants to start with a question? 
<laughs> it's like a full room. There must be questions. There's no such thing as a silly question, which might be a bit rude. Okay. Yeah, so there is no thing as a silly question, so I have a friend here asking about your suit. Um, I got given that the other day by my colleagues. Um, so um, I, d I, d I don't normally dress as Pikachu. The avatar's not actually me. Don't Google it, though. <laughs> Um, I'm really inept at using beard trimmers and just keep on having accidents. <laughs> uh, what if you meet John? What would you tell him? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's about right. I I don't I don't know to be honest. Um, it's really hard to say. I've, I'm not. I, I, you think I'd have a smart answer to that one? But no. Um, don't, the, th the thing is, I, 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 I yeah, <laughs> who invented cybersecurity? Um, I think he invented fucking cybersecurity, though, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Which is different. <laughs> the, I think we just challenge him on this whole thing, but he openly states that he receives payment to, uh, to promote cryptocurrency stuff. So you know it. it his motivations are unknown to us, so just I can't. I feel a little bit sad now. Like I, there was one morning I woke up and there was over two thousand five hundred notifications on Twitter, and then like I got up like on Thursday morning and there was like six. <laughs> I feel kind of empty now. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for your talk, and we're gonna move to the next one.